This video has been sponsored by NordVPN. You can go to nordvpn.com slash Red to get 77% off a three-year plan. Today I'll be making a chemical called 2,2,4-dinitrobenzylpyridine, or DNBP for short, which exhibits something called photochromism. This means that when it's exposed to light, it undergoes a reversible change in color. Under normal conditions, it's a brownish yellow, but when it's exposed to UV or sunlight, it turns blue. Then if it's left in the dark for several hours, it slowly reverts back. There are some photochromic compounds that are relatively fast in both directions though, and they're used to make things like those glasses that darken when you go outside. Other compounds also transition between different colors and are used in many products like toys, clothing, and cosmetics. I don't plan to at the moment, but in the future I might try to make some of these other photochromic compounds. For most of my videos, I just make the chemical for fun and to explore the science, but this time, there was another reason. The only chemical company that I can order from is Sigma, and they sell 50 milligrams of DNBP for $163, which is insanely overpriced. Sigma sells its precursor for way cheaper though, so it made a lot more sense for me to just buy that and to make it myself. I don't really have exact numbers, but I think to make 50 milligrams, it cost me something like 25 cents. In any case, my main goal for this video was to make the DNBP and then to try out a few things with it that I thought might be cool. For example, I wanted to try developing a photo from a negative print and making a color changing plastic. I also just wanted to mess around with it in general and to test out some of its properties. Now in terms of chemicals, I'll be using sulfuric acid, nitric acid, diethyl ether, sodium hydroxide, and 2-benzylpyridine that I got from Sigma. All the other chemicals were either purchased locally or from eBay. To start things off, I added 12 mils of concentrated sulfuric acid and a stir bar to a small flask. Then I set up an ice bath and I let it cool to around 5C. To the acid, I slowly added 2.5 mils of 2-benzylpyridine and a faint yellow color appeared. I let this stir for a few minutes and then I added 2.25 mils of concentrated nitric acid. This entire addition was done carefully and dropwise over the course of about 4 minutes. During this time, it went through a range of colors, but by the end, it was pretty much colorless. At this point, the flask was taken out of the ice bath, and the next step was to heat it. So I put it into a hot water bath, and I also added an air-cooled condenser to help stop the vapors from escaping. I turned on the hot plate, and the reaction was heated to 100 C for about 20 minutes. What was going on here was a nitration reaction where two nitro groups were being added to the 2-benzylpyridine to make DNBP. In a bit more detail, the first step was a reaction between the sulfuric and nitric acid to make nitronium ions. These were the active nitrating species and they were attacked by the 2-benzylpyridine. Under these conditions, DNBP was the major product, but I'm sure that to a certain extent, other nitrated forms were also made. These just had to be purified out in the workup, and you'll see how I did that. When it was done, I took away the water bath, and I let it cool a bit. Then, I poured it into about 200 grams of ice. I also used a small amount of water to wash the flask, and I dumped that in as well. What I had here was a mixture of my product and concentrated acids, and the next step was to neutralize it. This was done by using a solution of sodium hydroxide that I made by mixing 20 grams in 250 mils of water. When it was added, it immediately reacted with the acid to form sodium sulfate, sodium nitrate, and water. These reactions generated a lot of heat, which is why it was important to include all the ice. It was also important to keep it at or below room temperature, and you'll see why in a minute. When it was done, I tested the pH, and I saw that it was strongly basic, which was good. Then on top of this, I added 200 mils of diethyl ether. I took out the glass rod and turned on the magnetic stirring, and the mixture quickly started darkening. I don't think the color change was because of the ether though, and I think it was just the strong base causing some side products to polymerize. It wasn't stirring as well as it should have been, so I swapped out the stir bar for a much larger one. It was a lot better this time, and I was able to mix in all the ether. What I was doing here was a solvent extraction, where the desired product was getting dissolved into the ether. Most of the other junk like sodium sulfate, sodium nitrate, and other side products should stay dissolved in the water. 
The reason why the temperature had to be low for this was because diethyl ether has a very low boiling point and it's extremely volatile. I needed to let this stir for about 20 minutes and if the solution were hot, all my ether would have just boiled away. In any case, after stirring it for 20 minutes, I poured it all into a separatory funnel. It very quickly separated where the upper layer was the ether and the bottom was the water. Just to make sure that the separation fully went to completion, I let it sit here for about an hour. I then drained off the bottom water layer, which at this point is just waste and it contains side products and other junk. As a safety note, it also has a bit of ether dissolved in it, so even though it's water, it can still pose a fire hazard. What I did to deal with this waste was I just drained it all into a beaker and then I put it at the back of my fume hood and I let it evaporate for about a week. Then I put the solid crust that remained into a dry waste container. Getting back to the preparation though, the upper ether layer that was still in the separatory funnel was poured into a flask. Just like how the water layer contained a bit of ether, my ether layer contained a bit of water. I needed to get rid of it and to do this I added anhydrous magnesium sulfate. Magnesium sulfate forms stable complexes with water, so when it's added, it pulls it from the ether. And when it does this, it tends to just clump up and sit at the bottom. When there's little to no water left though, it stays loose and the solution becomes cloudy when it's shaken. It's usually best to add small amounts and to wait for it to pick up the water, but I was a bit impatient. I almost definitely added way too much, which might slightly impact the yield, but it's really not a big deal. To separate the magnesium sulfate, it's really easy and I just filtered everything through a cotton ball. When everything had passed through, I washed the magnesium sulfate in the flask and the bit that was in the cotton with a small amount of ether. I originally planned to set up a distillation and to recover the ether, but at the last minute I decided not to. I instead went with the lazy method and I poured it all into a beaker. Then I turned on the hot plate and I set up a fan off screen to help evaporate it. Just as a point of safety, diethyl ether is extremely flammable, so this had to be done in a very well ventilated area. When it got down to around 40 mils, I transferred it to a smaller beaker. I ended up missing the exact moment, but a lot of solid quickly precipitated from the solution, which was actually the DNBP. I kept heating and evaporating it until it got to about 30 mils, and then I put it into an ice bath to get out as much as possible. Then, to separate it off, I gravity filtered it. When all the ether had passed through, I washed the filter and the beaker with a small amount of ice cold ethanol. I spread out the filter on some paper towel to dry, and this is what it looked like the next day. The final yield was 2.05 grams, and I think it cost me like $10 to make this. To test it out and to see if it was actually photochromic, I just had to expose it to sunlight. It very quickly started to change color, and it told me that my synthesis worked. What was going on here was a UV-induced change in the structure of the molecule. According to a paper that I found, the hydrogen in red is first transferred to an oxygen in the nitro group, generating the so-called OH form. The nitro group then quickly flips to the other side, and the hydrogen is picked up by the nitrogen, generating the NH form, which is blue. This one's much longer lived and can last for hours because shifting the hydrogen back to the carbon isn't very favorable. The reason it changes color is because the NH form has a different absorption spectrum. In its initial form, it mostly absorbed light around 400 nanometers, which is a deep violet. Most of the light that it doesn't absorb is reflected though, and it's what we see. To predict what this color should be, I can just take a look at a complementary color wheel, and I quickly see that its complement is yellow. The NH form instead absorbs light around 600 nanometers, which is a light orange. And now, if I take another look at the color wheel, I see that the complement of this is a dark blue. This reversible shift in absorption spectra is the general mechanism behind most forms of photochromism. Something that I find interesting is that not all forms of DNBP are necessarily photochromic, and it can depend on what solvent it was crystallized from. The rotation of the nitro group is extremely important, and some crystalline forms of DNBP just don't really allow it to happen. In my case, it all worked out fine, but apparently some commercial sources of it don't exhibit photochromism until they're recrystallized from an appropriate solvent. Another thing that I find interesting is that the NH forms only long lived when the DNBP is a solid like it is here. 
The basic explanation for this is that the rigid crystalline structure prevents the molecules from moving around and shifting back to their old state. When it's dissolved in a small amount of acetone though, the molecules are able to move around much more freely and they can quickly revert back. Just for fun, I let all the acetone evaporate, I re-exposed it to sunlight, and added more acetone. When I did it this way, I felt that not only did it look cooler, but the effect was also a lot more evident. What I wanted to try next was to see if I could use it to develop a photo. I thought it would be cool to use the same process that I did for my cyanotype video, except I'd be able to reuse this paper over and over. To do this, I needed to coat some paper with a DNBP, and I tried several ways, but pretty much all of them failed. I only found one that kind of worked okay, where it was first dissolved in a small amount of acetone, and then slightly precipitated by adding water. The struggle here though, was that if too little water were used, it wouldn't go on the paper very well, but if too much were used, the DNBP would crystallize out as solid chunks. However, after a couple attempts, I managed to get a good mixture, and I used it to coat two pieces of watercolor paper. On each of them, I applied several coats, let them dry overnight, and the next day, I tried to develop something. I converted one of my digital photos to a negative, and printed it onto a transparency. I then put this on top of the paper, and I sandwiched it between two pieces of glass. I took this all outside, and the moment I exposed it to sunlight, it immediately started to darken. I had no idea how long I should have exposed it for, so I just let it go until I thought it was done, which was about 4 minutes. When I went back inside and took a look at it though, it was severely overexposed. So I did it again using my other paper, but this time I only developed it for 40 seconds. The image from this run was a lot better, but it was honestly still pretty bad. I think the biggest issue was just applying the DNBP to the paper, and if I found out a better method, I can improve the quality a lot. If any of you happen to have any ideas on how I could do this, I'd love to hear about it in the comments. When DNBP is left in the dark for several hours, it slowly converts back to its yellow form using the thermal energy that's present at room temperature. If it's heated though, this conversion happens way faster. To demonstrate this, I used one of my papers from before, which had already faded quite a bit. I wanted it all to be in the blue form though, so I just let it sit in sunlight for about a minute. I then blasted it with my heat gun, and almost like magic, the color started disappearing. It only took me about 30 seconds to completely erase everything. I tried exposing it to sunlight again, but it seemed like it was dead. After 5 minutes, there was very little change, and I figured that I just heated it up too much and destroyed the DNBP. There were still a few spots that managed to survive though, so I blasted them with more heat. Just for fun, I decided to shoot some water and acetone onto it, and I honestly expected nothing to happen. To my surprise though, the water apparently fixed the DNBP somehow, and allowed it to become blue again. The acetone, on the other hand, didn't seem to do anything. I'm not exactly sure why this happened, but I think the heat put it into a non-photochromic conformation, and the water somehow put it back into the other form. I didn't explicitly try it, but I feel like it could be an interesting way to write a secret message. I could make ink with the DNBP, write a letter, develop it, and then erase it using heat. To see what I wrote, it would have to first be treated with water, dried, and then exposed to sunlight. The last thing that I wanted to do was to see if I could make some color changing plastic. I could have used a lot of different resins, but I happened to have some epoxy from another project I was working on, so I just decided to use that. A small amount of the DNBP was added to a mortar, and then I poured in part A of the epoxy. The DNBP was able to dissolve into it, and I mixed it around as thoroughly as I could. After a couple minutes, I poured it into a plastic cup, and added the other part of the epoxy. This caused a slight color change to occur, which normally doesn't happen. The addition of the DNBP definitely caused it, but I don't really know why. In any case, I mixed this as thoroughly as I could, poured it into another cup, and then stirred it for another couple minutes. I then added all of it to a teddy bear mold that I got from Amazon. What was weird though was that as it cured, it slowly changed colors. I'm not sure why, but for some reason in this epoxy, the DNBP seems to be more stable in its blue form. I thought that maybe it would eventually change back, 
but it never did. The next day, I tried demolding it, but it was honestly kind of a pain. I eventually got it out though, and in my opinion, the bear turned out pretty well. At first, I thought it was just locked in the blue form, and that it was no longer photochromic. However, I figured it wouldn't hurt to just put it in sunlight, and to see what happened. To my surprise, it was actually still photochromic, but instead it was backwards this time. Most of the sunlight was also coming from the left side, so the color change wasn't even through the bear. I thought this was kind of cool though, so when it got to about the midpoint, I took it out of the light. I honestly would have really liked if it stayed like this, but because it's photochromic, it eventually goes back. I found the process to be extremely slow though, and over a day later, it still hadn't completely reverted. Another thing to mention is that most epoxies don't do well in sunlight, and it slowly discolors. I just used it because it was something I had on hand, but if I were to do it again, I'd probably use a different polymer. Anyway, I made a couple other bears, and I did some more runs just to check a couple things. For this one, I just wanted to confirm that it was possible to change the entire color of the bear if it just sat there long enough. And not surprisingly, it was, it just took about twice as long as the other time. This last run had a much lower concentration of DNBP, and it changed much quicker. It was also colorless, instead of being yellow. I then left them for a couple more days, just to see how long they'd take to turn back. The only one that really reverted, was the one that was left in the sunlight for the least amount of time. The first one that I did, appears to still be slowly changing, but I'm not sure if it'll ever fully go back. The one that I turned completely orange, and let sit in the sunlight for the longest amount of time, seemed to be stuck that way. Maybe it will eventually change though, and if it does, I'll be sure to update you guys. Anyway, I think that's about it for now. Feel free to share your theories about what you saw here, and other things you'd like me to try. Also, I've decided to give away three of these bears that I made, along with a beaker mug, to three lucky winners. I'll ship it anywhere in the world completely free of charge, and I'll also cover any duties or fees if you're hit with them. Entering the giveaway is completely free, but before I get into the details on how to do that, I'm just going to give a quick shout out to the sponsor of this video, NordVPN. NordVPN is an extremely useful service that encrypts and protects all the data that you exchange online. This means that your banking information, your passwords, and your browsing history in general is kept private. Without a VPN, your internet service provider can see almost everything that you do, and if you connect to public Wi-Fi, everything you're doing online is completely open to hackers. Personally, the idea of having any of my passwords or information stolen, and potentially compromising something as important as my channel, gives me a lot of anxiety. To deal with this, I make sure that I always use NordVPN on my phone, and I selectively use it on my desktop. There are apps available for many platforms, it's as easy to use as just clicking a button, and it lets you easily connect to over 4500 VPN servers around the world. Anyway, with that being said, if you're like me and you want to keep everything you do on the internet private and safe, you should definitely join NordVPN. They're offering all my viewers 77% off 3-year plans, which you can get by going to nordvpn.com slash nilred, or by clicking the link in the description. Okay, so now for the giveaway, it's pretty easy to enter, and you just have to follow the link on the screen here, or click the one in the description. You can enter once or multiple times, and to get an entry, you either just have to follow me on Twitter, subscribe to me on YouTube, or visit my Instagram. You can also get one by just visiting my severely neglected Facebook page. The drawing will be done in a week, and I'll directly contact the winners through email, and I'll also post them on Twitter. As usual, a big thanks goes out to all my supporters on Patreon. Everyone who supports me can see my videos at least 24 hours before I post them to YouTube. Also, everyone on Patreon can directly message me, and if you support me with $5 or more, you'll get your name at the end like you see here. 